Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for stopping by and checking out my videos. Okay, this is part two of the upgrades for the 2021 Can-Am Defender. This is the limited model. Check out my first video where I installed some 32 inch KM3s, uh, forward A-arms. I think I also swapped out the wire rope for synthetic, plus a couple other things. So again, just like in the first video, I did not get a chance to record anything while I was doing the install. So this is just a walk around of the things that I did. All right, let's start with the mat tracks. So got rid of the tires and installed a set of mat tracks, XTURs. And here's the XT pluses for the rear. It gives you a little bit of more square inch uh, pattern on the snow with those plus models in the back Okay up on the front here installed four amber LEDs cube lights These are the flood version on the sides and then in the middle. There's two spotlights Those are of course are controlled by a rocker switch up in the dash. I'll show you that here in just a minute the next thing I installed is a backup module from Sam's Backup Lights. Shout out to Jake over there for helping me diagnose a problem that I had with it on the weekend. We got it all figured out, super simple. Uh, he's awesome to deal with. So if you're looking for a backup module that will control your reverse lights or your backup lights, just by using the uh, stock uh, shifter, so you don't have to install a separate rocker switch. This works by uh, tying into the data connector and then as you shift from park into reverse, it'll activate the lights that you have in the back. I'll show you that here in just a minute as well. This is the track module from Can-Am that you're gonna wanna install if you install tracks and that goes in line with Sam's backup lights. Uh, they tie in together there into the data connector Super easy plug and play, easy to easy to do. This is an upgraded horn. I installed the Ryko turn signal kit on this machine, uh, part number eight one zero two, which has the upgraded uh, accent lights. But the stock horn that comes with that kit just isn't loud enough. So this is an upgraded horn. Uh, the brand name is Hella, H E L L A. So check those guys out, um, super, super loud. I, I mean, I dig it. Uh, I've installed them on several machines now. The next thing I did was install the Can-Am plug here. This is for your wired uh, winch remote. So you can plug that in there, go in and out with the remote for your winch. All right, moving up top here. This is a 50 inch black series light bar from Rough Country. So just a note here, what I did, I started by mounting it to the roof and the weight of the bar was turning this down like that and actually uh, kind of rotating the roof a little forward. So what I did instead is I drilled through this plate here, ran a bolt through, there's two eighth inch shims and a couple of rubber washers inside here just to help keep that pretty rigid. And then the nuts and washers for the bolt are back in behind here. Next here is the Can-Am side mirrors. I had installed a set of aftermarket mirrors. They look very similar to this. You can find them on Amazon and other places. They're even a little bit bigger. I think maybe they stick up here another inch or so. I had those on there for a little bit and just did not like the quality of those mirrors. So got rid of those and upgraded to the actual Can-Am mirrors. And I would recommend that 100%. Don't waste your time with the cheap ones. The quality just is not there in those other ones. Okay, so moving to the inside here. I installed some new rocker switches. These are for the floodlights 
or excuse me, fog lights or dust lights as, as they call them. Uh, these switches are from over the river and through the woods, the switch guys. Um, super cool guys. Um, I like to try to keep the lights similar. So, you know, these are the stock Can-Am. They have the little dimples here. You can get the same ones uh, through those guys um, because these are all Carling uh, switches. So um, they have multiple different uh, patterns or rocker covers here that you can buy. Uh, I just opt for this one that said dust light because it looks very similar to, to the fog lights that I have front there. Activate those. You can kind of see how bright those are. Okay, so the next thing here is that Ryko turn signal kit. So this is a steering post mounted kit, very similar to what you have in an automobile. And I, I like these because they're similar to what you have in an automobile and they're not a rocker switch that's gonna be down here. It's gonna take up another spot, uh, you know, cause everybody knows you have limited spaces for extra switches. You can never have enough of those. So I do like these. I did opt for the, um, little jumper wire that actually goes into the instrument cluster so you can see those green arrows flashing when you have them activated. I'll show you what those ambers accent lights look like up front. I think that adds a pretty cool touch to the machine. And here's that other horn that I installed. Again, super loud there. All right, jumping into the cab here. What I also installed is a voltmeter. It also has two USB ports on it. And the wiring on that is, is pretty simple because right behind the dash panel here is uh, a little bus bar. It's got a positive, uh, which is ignition source, and a ground uh, stud as well. So just a little short run to those for ground and ignition power. And that way those, or that LED light there will turn off when I turn the ignition off. Just like that. All right, up to the top here. Move this out of the way. So I'll start here with the windshield wiper. You'll notice that there's two switches. Normally it only has one switch and it is a off, on, and then momentary on switch and that is activating your wiper, and then the momentary part of it will activate the washer uh, fluid. So what I've done here is I've moved the terminals that were in the switch for the washer fluid, moved that over to its own individual switch, and then I've rewired this switch and included a delay relay. Now what that's gonna allow us to do is you can activate the switch just like normal, It'll go up to the top. That'll activate the wiper, just like normal from the factory. And it'll just continue to operate until you turn the switch off, okay? And that works great when you have, you know, a substantial rainfall, right? Um, that thing just continues to go just like it would in your car or any other machine. But what I thought would be cool is if we could make that wiper also work just like in an automobile, where it would be delayed or it would be intermittent. And so what I installed is called a, a delay relay, and it's programmable from zero to 999 seconds. What it allows you to do is program the on and then also the off. So in this case, I have this programmed to operate for three seconds and then be off for seven seconds on for three seconds, off for seven seconds. And it'll continue to do that as long as the switch is turned to the bottom position. As soon as you turn the switch off, it'll stop. Okay, with that being said, I have tried <laughs> over and over again to reprogram this thing so it will perfectly stop and start right here at the park position. And I realize I'm just not able to do that. And the main reason is uh, because the amount of moisture that's on the uh, window is creating friction on the wiper blade, okay? So if there's not a lot of moisture on it, it's going to create more friction, and the, the 
time that it takes for this thing to go back and forth will will be basically shortened, right? Um, so again, it's not perfect. Um, it does work. I've already tested this out and it, it works great. Just have to know that if the wiper starts here, that, you know, three seconds as I have timed it with, you know, spraying the windshield with a fair bit of water, um, it should, it should return. But in many cases, it's not going to, it's going to stop here. The next time it might stop here or all the way up here. Just know that going into it. And then I'll show you that here in just a minute. Okay. The next thing I did here, I installed the SSV works 200 watt amplifier. It is pushing four, six and a half inch kicker speakers. There's two up front here. And the other two are in the rear. Also up here is the new rocker switch. This is for a set of rear cube lights that I have in the back. They're separate from the reverse lights that I have that are tied to that Sam's backup module. These are more of like work lights. Um, they, they shine over the top of the bed. You can rotate them out to the side of you 90 degrees if you want. Uh, so I'll show you those here in just a minute. And then the new switch for the front light bar. Now, in my first video, I, I think I explained that I added another dome light here. What I changed this time around after talking with the customer is that he wanted the light bar, the, the rear lights, the stereo, and the dome lights to be able to be turned on without the ignition on. So underneath here is a three post bus bar has ground and then two studs that are tied to the ignition. So I moved one of those, uh, the wires that are on one of the studs over to the other one that is ignition powered. That left me with a, a blank stud basically. And I ran a new wire that goes through the headliner down that pillar, and then has an inline fuse directly to the battery. That allowed me to have 24 hour power right up here. And then from there, I tied in the dome lights, both the front and rear dome lights here. And then I also tied in the stereo, the rear lights, and the light bar. And you can see that, so I don't have the ignition on. Everything's off. So that's the front light bar, rear lights, dome light. I'm not going to turn the stereo on because it'll try to connect my phone and then I won't be able to record this video. So, but if you want to add 24 hour power up here to do these types of things, that's all you need to do is run a wire down over to the battery. There's already, uh, that, that post is basically hollow, so if you pull this headliner apart, there's a hole up at the top, and you can run your wire right down. It comes out behind the firewall, like in the engine compartment, and then you run it back down to where the battery is. So hopefully that uh, kind of explains all that. So let me show you the windshield wiper uh, operation here. I'll turn this on. I'll just put a little bit of fluid here on the window. And this is the run for three seconds, and it'll stop for seven. I'm just going to put a little bit more fluid on there. You can see where it stopped. It stopped at a good position up here. Let's see, the next time it's going to stop right here. And like I say, I have messed around with this. I've made it you know, 3.1 seconds, uh, 3.8, 4.2, I've, I've delayed, the delay doesn't matter, or the, the off doesn't necessarily matter as much, uh, but I've, I've tried it and tried it several times to get it to, to, to start up here and go, let's say, one or two times and then come back and stop, and again, it just depends on how much moisture is on the, on the window itself, see, so now it stopped over there, so if it, was raining very hard obviously you would just push it up and it would just run constantly all the time just like it normally does 
I was just trying to get it to, um, you know, again, try to be like a an automobile to where it would be if it was just a light rain or a mist, you know, and it wasn't worth just having that thing constantly on or so you don't have to constantly be reaching up here, turning it on and off, on and off as you're driving. Because we all hate that sound that it makes, you know, that rubber across the uh, across the windshield there. So hopefully that explains that. If you have any questions on that, uh, delay, relay, um, uh, put something down in the comments and, and I will try to explain that or how it's wired or anything else I can do uh, for you for that. Okay, so turn on the uh, cube lights in the back here. Again, these are Rough Country Black Series. So when you purchase these, they come with the mount bracket here that mounts to the um, door hinge. They also come with the bracket that mounts the light bar to, or excuse me, the cube light to the mounting bracket. And what I was talking about earlier is, as far as being able to rotate these, what I did is I used a, a, actually a square headed bolt and two washers and a spring and a lock nut right there. And that just holds enough tension on these things to where as they're going down the road, you know, and they're not gonna rattle, they're not gonna move. But if you needed to turn the light, you know, and shine it over here and work on somebody else's machine or, you know, see something that's over in the woods or whatever you need it to do, you can do that. Uh, normally they're gonna be pointed to the very back here. Okay, let me show you how that SAM's backup module works. So you got the ignition on. I'm in park right now. I'm just gonna shift down into reverse. And these little round LEDs, they're a two inch LED. Uh, the, from the factory right here, there's a re little reflector. You just cut that out and install these two, two inch LEDs. So now when you shift out of reverse, say into drive, I got just shifted down into low. You can see those lights are off. Now you, there is a manual override and this is cool because you could be parked somewhere and if you needed a little extra light in the back, you could do so. All right, so I'm in park right now. This is how you do the manual override. You're gonna shift down to neutral, press and hold the brake pedal for two seconds. Let off. And you see those lights are on. Okay, you see that? Now you can shift into park or into high or low. I'm just shifted back down into low. See, they're still on. Now, to get them out of the manual override mode, you just do the opposite or same thing, I guess. Shift it back into neutral. Press and hold the brake, let off, put it back into park, and you see those lights are off. Okay, so that's how that works. All right, a couple other things. I have a extra belt, spare belt holder, and that actually also holds the uh, belt tool, the clutch tool to actually open up the shivs for the belt so you can take the belt off. I installed a Trail Tech belt temp gauge right up here. Now, I'll tell you, uh, there's been some discussion about these on forums and in other videos about how these aren't accurate. And, and the, I'll tell you, the reason is because they're an ambient air temperature gauge, okay? They're not an infrared. They're not gonna tell you the exact temperature of the belt. They're gonna tell you the temperature of the air in the CVT housing, okay? So right here at the exhaust side of the CVT, you drill a, I think it's a 1364 hole, and then you just thread this um, temperature sender, sending unit into that hole, a little bit of high temp uh, RTV, and then I just ran the wires 
up the intake tube, down underneath the washer fluid, and then about over in there somewhere, they turn with other wires uh, from the factory. They turn and go actually into the cab. So that's where that is. Um, I, I've seen, I've read reports that people have determined that these things are about 40 degrees off from what the actual belt temp is. So I feel like that's okay as long as you are aware of that. So, you know, if the, if the gauge is showing about 200, then you can expect that your belt is actually probably running about 240 degrees. So I think you just keep that in mind. Um, otherwise, uh, probably install a infrared uh, belt temp gauge like uh, the Razorback is a good example. Those are pretty good uh, temperature gauges. That would be the option that I would choose if you actually wanted an infrared belt temp gauge and wanted to know the actual temperature of the belt itself. Another thing I did in here when we had the headliner all out, uh, if you look at my first video, I talked about putting some sound deadening and the heat uh, matting material in there and then also down in the sides. So when I had the headliner apart, I took the sound deadening material and I lined the entire roof with it, front to back, any little pockets, and you know, there's some weird angles and stuff in here. Um, I lined that all with the sound deadening material. I felt that it made such a difference in the back just uh, to eliminate a lot of the engine noise. So I went ahead and did the same there. Uh, so that way, you know, anything going across, whether it be tree limbs or anything else uh, going across the roof or just regular sound in general, trying to make this thing as quiet as possible. Um, so that way you don't get uh, all the engine noise. You know, you don't have to crank the stereo up so loud either. All right, another thing I added here, I almost forgot these. These are the little cargo or storage nets that come from Can-Am. Uh, super easy to put in these. And then I lined the bottom of these uh, storage areas with felt. You can get some high... Um, some heavy duty felt from like Joann's fabrics or maybe Michael's and then a little spray adhesive that worked good for those. Also here on the back, I'll show you these. Again, these are the Can-Am storage nets. And then here again, I just lined all four sides, the, the three sides and the bottom. Uh, so just to help protect, you know, if you put a phone in there, you know, they slide around a lot and, can mar up your screens or, or your case or something like that. So just went ahead and did that as well while we were there. The other thing I did here, which <laughs> doesn't really mean much now, but in my part one video, there were some questions asked, I guess a, a couple things. One is, did I do anything regarding adding the 32 inch tires for the Speedo? And I did, actually, before we brought this machine in and started putting tracks on it, I did take it down to my local dealer, and they essentially reflashed the ECU for the larger tires. And I checked that before and after. There was about a four mile per hour difference when I added the 32 inch tires versus the stock 27 inch tires. And then when we got done with it, um, using a GPS, uh, on my phone versus what was on the speedometer, there was only a mile per hour difference uh, after the dealership had reflashed the ECU. So that is an option for you guys. If you are adding taller tires, whether they be 30s or 32s, you can have the dealership, uh, at least where I'm at in North Idaho, they did it for me. Um, took just a couple of minutes. I drove it down there and uh, they reflashed it, charged me 20 bucks for it and we were on our way. The other question that I've got in part one was if we did any clutching on the machine and didn't do any clutching yet. When we put the tires back on, we are gonna uh, be looking at doing a clutch kit, probably a um, maybe a Dalton clutch kit or something else. Uh, don't know yet, but if you were watching part one and you were curious about that, we are going to be looking into doing a clutch kit once we put the tires back on. 
I think that's about it, guys. Um, again, thank you all for watching my videos, supporting the channel, giving me feedback. I do appreciate that uh, a lot. And I'm going to get ready for the next build. I just wanted to make sure I wrapped up this one, gave you a part two walk around of all the things that I did to it here, getting it ready for the winter in North Idaho. All right. Thank you guys again. Hit the like and subscribe. You know what to do. Appreciate it. Till next time. See you then.